Good morning, West Portal. Welcome here this morning. As Jeff said, we are glad that you are here. We're glad that you are here with us, and we're glad that you are here with us. This morning as I walked into the church again, I was reminded of that saying that's right above our welcome center, you belong here. Wherever you are, we want to welcome you to be part of this family. And if there's any way that we can help you out in your walk, if we could come alongside with words of encouragement or with prayer, uh, we would ask that you would connect with us. You can use our website. You can message us, however it is. We're called to be a, a family together, to walk with one another. So I'm glad that you're here And my prayer has been that wherever you are, that you would hear the Spirit speaking to you today. And this morning, the Spirit says, wake up. Uh, A a friend of mine told about a, a job that he had while he was going through college. Now, he's very passionate about soccer, uh, about, uh, and so his evenings were dedicated to soccer, uh, to getting better, getting uh, noticed, getting to the next level. And in the daytime, he would work as a, in a construction firm, in a large construction firm. But what would happen is that the evenings would oftentimes go late. With practice and then hanging out and going out, the mornings came all too early and he would find himself sleepwalking through work. Except one time that he found he could actually sleep at work. You see, in the, in the workers' lounge, there was a key on the wall to the supply room. He had been to the supply room, a dark room, no windows, one door with a lock on it. And what he did is one time he appropriated the key, went down to the supply room, opened it up, locked the door behind him, and then had himself a little nap. He, he woke up, went back up, and put the key on the wall, and no one was the wiser. It worked so well that he tried it again. And pretty soon this became a a regular pattern until one day that the site supervisor needed to get into the supply room. He went to the, the wall where the key usually is, didn't find it there. So he marched down to the supply room and started banging on the door. Is anyone there? Hey! And he shook the handle. My friend was startled. He, he woke up from his nap not knowing what to do. So he, stood there, he stayed there silently until the supervisor went away. And then he quickly slinked out of there, put the key on the wall, and he never used that room again. Well... This is how it can be. He is still known as somewhat of a, of, a, of a napper. But could you imagine getting caught sleeping while you're at work? Or having a reputation as, a, as the napster? Can you imagine sleepwalking through life? Um, being, being physically present but being uh, absent from your family, from your spouse, from, uh, from, from your, the people around you. Can you imagine being spiritually absent um, of sleepwalking or of being a church that's known as napping? Well, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus talks to the church in Sardis and he says to them, Wake up. Wake up. Why? Well, Sardis was known as an alive town. It was a thriving city. If you visit Sardis today, you'll see that there's a a, a gymnasium, these uh, Roman roads, uh, great Roman bathhouses, and there's a synagogue there. Sardis had a large Jewish community. And uh, this Jewish community built a synagogue. In fact, it's one of the largest synagogues of the ancient world. Um, Sardis was known as a wealthy city. It was said that the, the river flowed with gold. And it did. There was gold dust from Mount Tamales flowing through the city. And in Sardis, they developed a technique to extract the gold from the water and, and minted gold coins of high purity and high value. 
The city was also known for its red dye and its woolen garments, pure woolen garments. And Sardis was known as an unassailable city, an unconquerable city. You see, it was built on the spur of Mount Timolus. And so it was overlooking a great plain, 1,000 feet up. And it had three walls around it to guard the edges. And it's back against the mountain, the unclimbable mountain. And so it was thought to be unassailable. But almost In 569 BC, King Cyrus, who we read about in our Old Testament, he came to town. He tried a frontal assault and was defeated. But then some of his soldiers found a way along the unclimbable mountain and came in through the back. And to their surprise, there was no guard there, no watchman. And so they snuck into the city, opened up the gates, and the city was captured. They were conquered because the watchmen were asleep. They didn't watch. They didn't wake up. And you'd think they had learned from their lesson. But then in 219 BC, history repeated itself. Antiochus, a Greek general, came to town. And again, his soldiers found a way up the unclimbable mountain. And again, there were no guards on watch there. And so the city was taken Again, twice. And so twice to this church in Sardis, Jesus says, wake up. The most often repeated command in the New Testament, wake up. And the Spirit says to us today, wake up. So if I shook you there, grab your Bibles, turn them to Revelation chapter 3, and follow along as we listen to this passage together. To the church in service. To the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in service who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, thanks guys for reading that. This morning I want to walk through this passage with four points. And the first is to wake up to who Jesus is. In 96 AD, when John writes this letter, Sardis was again a thriving community, a, a, a city that was known to be alive. It was wealthy, and, and the worship of the emperor was taking place there. But more greater than that was the temple to Artemis, the, the patron goddess of Sardis. And Artemis was known to have life, to be able to bring life to the dead. And so listen how Jesus addresses the church there. Verse 1, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. 
The seven spirits of God. Seven being the number of fullness, of completeness. Not that there's seven different Holy Spirits. There is one Spirit, and Jesus has the completeness of the Spirit. The Spirit that gives life. See, Jesus is saying, it's not Artemis who holds life, but I do. I bring life from death. I call into being those things that are not. And in his other hand are the seven stars, which stand for the seven angels, those who report to him. Jesus is saying, I know, I am fully alert to what is going on in this church. See, Jesus knows what the church needs, and he has what the church needs. So wake up to who Jesus is. Secondly, Jesus says, wake up to what you are doing. Now this is a hard point, but this is what Jesus says to the sleeping church. Verse 1, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. You're known for being alive. But you're dead. See, uh, the people of Sardis would have thought that the church was alive. The church at Sardis was the biggest church in all of Asia Minor at this time. And the people of Sardis, the, the church members would have thought their church was alive. The foyer would be buzzing with activity. The website would be full of events. Multiple services, strategic goals, organized committees... Great luncheons. But for all this, Jesus says, dead. You are dead. Why? Well, verse 2. I know your deeds. I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Now, Jesus is aware of everything. He knows the deeds. And he knows the motivation behind the deeds. And he says these are unfinished. Incomplete. Well, what does that mean? Unfinished. It, it could mean that they're simply not finished. That, that Sardis was a church that was good at starting things, not so much so in finishing. They would have great plans to reach the city, to make a difference. But these plans would run out of steam and fizzle out. Uh, they didn't count the cost. They simply didn't finish what they started. That's not hard to imagine. Or it could be that it was unfinished, that they had much, uh, a lot of deeds going on, but the deeds were not directed toward God. They had a lot of church work, but they forgot about the work of the church. See, the, the busyness that was going on wasn't directed toward the living God and his glory and his kingdom. That... Uh, that they're busy doing things, but they forget why they're doing them. Or more, they forget for whom they are doing them. And that's, that's a temptation for us too. That we can have swinging music, stirring preaching, a, a, a seamless a streaming but we can miss the whole point. That we're here to meet with God. I mean, who is it that this service is for? For you? For you? For me? It's for God. And we notice this temptation when we ask the question, so what did you get out of uh, the service today? Did you enjoy the service? And the question should be, was God pleased with our service today? What did I put in to this service? It could be unfinished. Or it might be unfinished in that they stopped confessing the name of Jesus. They became silent about Jesus as Lord. Now, 
Let me explain that. See, throughout the Roman Empire, people needed, every citizen needed to make a, a, a worship of the emperor. They would walk into the temple and throw a pinch of incense and say, Kaiser Curia, Caesar is Lord. Everyone had to do that, except the Jews. The Jews were exempt from this. And there was a large Jewish community in Sardis. And the Christians weren't that different, except for that one thing, Jesus. And so if they kept quiet on that Jesus is Lord, and that he calls all people everywhere to repent, to believe in him, to follow him, if they were quiet on that, they could fly under the radar. Uh, they could continue to have their services. They could meet together. They could do everything that they were used to doing. If they just kept quiet. And the reason uh, that I, I think this has merit is that in every other letter to the churches in Asia Minor, John mentions persecution, a heresy, Pressure. But there's none of that here. See, perhaps the church became silent. Die Stille im Land. And so the church didn't face persecution. And so they exchanged the cross for comfort. They exchanged a private belief for public witness. They chose to be towards cheap grace. Towards not standing out. A gospel that had no offense. Because it had no content. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his age, he speaks against the church. And he speaks uh, against the church that had accommodated to the culture and to the political powers. And he calls them out. He says cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness. Without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. True grace is costly. Because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Cheap grace is grace without Jesus Christ. And we, can, we, we know this temptation. It's easy to want to fly under the radar, not to stir the waters by bringing up Jesus as Lord with our neighbors, with our teammates, to, to leave that part quiet that Jesus calls all people to bend their knee to him and to call him Lord. That's a temptation today. It's easier to live by platitudes to, to be the difference without ever mentioning who it is that makes the difference. To, be, uh, uh, to make peace without ever talking about the peacemaker. Now, uh, a Barna survey from 2019 found that 47% 40 of active Christian millennials think that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hope that they will one day share the same faith. It's wrong to share faith in Jesus in hope that someone of a different faith will come to believe in Jesus. 47%. But of that same group, almost all of them believe the best thing that could happen is for someone to receive Jesus. How do we hold that together? That we believe that the best thing that can happen to anyone is that they come to know Jesus. And yet we don't want to talk about Jesus because we don't want to offend others. How is that? And I don't think this is only a problem for millennials. I think it's a problem for many of us. I know this is a challenge for me. 
Is it that we've stopped believing that Jesus works through his word and that his spirit is active in people's lives already and that he is calling us to walk faithfully? See, Jesus says to the sleeping church, wake up. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but without me, you're dead. Wake up. Wake up. Well, he tells us how we can wake up. And that moves us to point number three. Remember. Remember what you have heard and received. And strengthen what remains. If you look down at verse, uh, verse three. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast and repent. What you heard and received, remember the good news, the gospel. Paul spells this out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. See, that's the gospel, that Jesus died for your sins, that you and I need a savior, that we can't do enough good to save ourselves. And if that offends you, if that shocks you, then Jesus says, you need to repent. You need to change your opinion of yourself. And for us who have heard this before and who have believed this, we need to hold fast to it. Because this reminds us of who we are. That we are always in need of a Savior. That's the gospel that you received and that changes us. Remember what you have heard and received. And remember the spirit that you have received. See, we need to stay connected to Jesus. Jesus said this to his disciples in John chapter 15. John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can have a reputation for being alive, busy with services, balancing budgets, broadcasting to the world. But if this is done apart from Jesus and the life that he has by his spirit, it's nothing. You are dead. Remember in Acts chapter 19, when Paul was walking in the streets of Ephesus and he ran into those disciples and he told them, you need to still receive the Holy Spirit. Remember, remember what you have heard and what you have received. The Spirit of God, the life of God that indwelled Jesus is now the gift to every believer. Remember what you have received and what you have heard and strengthen what remains. Well, what is it that remains? The external structures. You see, Jesus isn't down on the structure. He knows that we need a time and a place and a plan as we gather together. He's not against this. It's just that the focus of this would be Jesus. To meet with Jesus and encounter the living God. He, Jesus is not down on small groups that we meet together and go through questions and, and do life together. But when, we, when our purpose is just to meet together and to get through the questions and then move on, we miss out. That, that, that's why we ask one another, what is God saying to you? And how are you going to respond to that? See, the structure is there 
for us to meet with Jesus. And this has been a season in which most of our programs have been, uh, have been stopped. And so we can evaluate them and say, is this helping us to know Jesus and make him known? If not, then we can prune it. And this is a time in which we can look at our lives and say, is this uh, an activity that's helping us to know Jesus and make him known? And if not, then we can prune this. And I would hold to you, or I would commend to you the series that we just did on Simplify to examine your life. You can look that up on, your we- on our website. But Jesus says, remember what you have heard and received and strengthen what remains. Remember. And finally, remember Jesus' warning and his promises. Jesus gives a warning here. He says, if you don't wake up I will come as a thief, and you won't know what hour. I will come. Jesus says, I am coming. And if you're not ready, it's going to be bad news. Like my friend in the supply room. Like Sardis at nighttime. Instead of blessing, it'll, he'll bring judgment. And this is not only talking of Jesus' uh, final coming, but of his imminent coming. That Jesus is at work in lives around you, in your children, in your spouse, in your neighbors. And if we're not watching for this, if we're not looking for this, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss out on that life that he has for us, this abundant life. That's Jesus' warning. And then Jesus promises. And he's so good, he gives us three promises here. Uh, Verse 5, if you look down. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. Now, white is a sign of purity. If, uh, if, if you walked around in dirty garments with, you know, a coffee stain or, or jam on it, it was a shame. If, you're, if your clothes were off white, the kind of yellowy white, it was a shame. And Jesus says to the people in Sardis, I will purify you. I will take care of your sin and your shame. Of the mess you make of yourself and the mess you make of others. I will dress you in white just like I am in white. It's a promise of purity. And white is also a, a, a sign or a symbol of victory. See, in those, in those ancient days, when the army came back home from a victorious campaign, the, the people would gather in the streets dressed in white and join in with the festivities. Jesus is saying, you'll be dressed in white. You're going to be part of victory parade when I come back. And uh, when I have victory, and you're going to have victory over all that drags life through the dirt. That's the first promise. The second promise, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. See, this was a, a capital city that had, had a collection, the clerical records of every citizen of the city. And their names would be blotted out if they died or if, if they were an embarrassment to the city, if, if they were banished from the city. And Jesus here says, I will never Never, ever blot out anyone. If you are seeking life, if you want to be with me, your name will never, ever be blotted out from the kingdom rolls. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's a great promise for us to hold on to. And the third promise, I will acknowledge that name before my father. And as the angels. See the temptation. Is to be quiet. To not want to offend. Anyone. To be silent. That Jesus is Lord. But Jesus promise. That those who live faithfully. In this life. That he will confess their names. To the father. Dad. These are the ones. Who loved me. And I love them. And I want them to be with us forever. Friends, we'll all be known for something. What is it that you want to be known for? For being busy? Active? 
napping, or being alive in Jesus. Michael Wilcox sums it up well. He says, Jesus has the spirit of life in one hand and the churches in, his, in the other. And so we pray, Jesus, bring your two hands together and bring life to your church. To the one who has ears, let them hear what the spirit has to say. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we want to close with prayer, but this will be a prayer of surrender to the Spirit. And so I want to invite you to stand if you want, if you want to invite the Spirit to do work in your life. It could be a prayer of recommitment, of knowing that you've been sleepwalking, uh, you, you, you've wanted to start good things. You've, you've had good intentions, but just not been able to follow through with them. Or you may be busy about other things, but forgot about the why or the for who. Or maybe that it's been difficult. You've been ashamed to talk about Jesus. You felt your heart beating, but it hasn't been able to, you haven't been able to share him. I want to invite you to recommit to having Jesus, to having the Spirit alive in your life. And for some, it may be a first time. You may uh, feel like you've been sleepwalking in life, that it's dull in your marriage, in your parenting. But you want to come alive. Jesus has life. He's come that we might live and live to the full. So I want to invite you to open up and to receive this life, and to confess Jesus as Lord. So if you, want, if you want to invite the Spirit in, I invite you to stand with me as we pray together. Jesus, you are the living Lord, and you have in your hand the church, and the Spirit, and you long for your church to be filled with your Spirit, to be filled with life, not to just go through the motions, but to live, not to be known for being alive, but to live, and you can do this, so Lord, we pray that you would do this, and we pray for that, not just for the, the church, but for our lives. You come to us individually and you call us to repent, to turn towards you, and to trust in you. Lord, we want to do that again today. We're, we're, we are sorry, oh Lord, where we've had uh, great intentions of sharing you, of making you known, but we failed to follow through on them. And Lord, we're sorry where we've been so busy in life that we've forgotten that this is all a gift for you and this is all to be lived towards you. And Lord, we're sorry where we've been ashamed of your name. We didn't want to offend others by saying that Jesus is Lord. Come, heal us. Fill us with your spirit that your people may walk victorious as you have victory. Jesus, only you are able to do this. So we pray, fill us with your spirit. We pray that this church would be known as a church that is alive for you. And that all your churches, Jesus, would be filled with your spirit. And so we join together with the prayer you taught all your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, let me leave you with the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forever. Amen. Amen. May you walk in victory today. Walk with Jesus.